Well, that's a bit odd. So, I mean, these are the kind of things that we should be looking at. We should be understanding biology. Everybody wants to throw up, oh, I've done this epidemiological study and I've done that epidemiological study, and they don't really have any basis for understanding root cause mechanisms. So basically a lot of what they say is biologically implausible. I'll, I'll, let's go on to, you know, for biologically implausibility, the next time, you know, somebody says, oh, you shouldn't eat saturated fat, play a little game. Okay, so why shouldn't we eat saturated fat? Because it will raise your LDL and LDL is bad for you. Okay, great. How does it raise my LDL? And they won't have an answer. There is no known plausible biological mechanism, either demonstrated experimentally or even postulated, by which saturated fat increases LDL levels, low density lipoprotein levels. And that's gonna shock a lot of people. And in actual fact, what it is, is that on a standard Western diet where you're consuming vegetable oils, the plant sterols are lowering they're artificially lowering. They're taking your LDL level from a healthy, normal, physiological level, and they're lowering it. And all that happens if you remove the seed oils from the diet, you allow your LDL level to return to a normal physiological level. How about a study from British Medical Journal that looked at what happened when they supplemented people with different fats and they had a look at the impact on their LDL levels. So they used a coconut oil that was 96% saturated fat from memory. And the standard is about 92, but in this study, I believe from memory, it was 96% saturated fat. And they compared it with butter, which was only 66% saturated fat. So the people who consumed the butter, the LDL level went up moderate amount. What do you think happened to the people who consumed the coconut oil? 96% saturated fat given that, you know, we know <laughs> that saturated fat increases LDL. Yeah. Well, their LDL levels actually went down. Now, the interesting thing was there wasn't really much discussion about this in the paper. I actually had to go to one of the appendices to actually get the data. And when I saw it, I said, well, I can see why they're keeping quiet about that because I'm sure that's not the point they're wanting to make. Bigger, but I mean, if they were genuine scientists, that would have been the headline of the paper. You know, saturated fat does not, you know, 96% saturated fat in coconut oil lowers LDL. I mean, that's an important empirical observation that informs our understanding of science. And instead it's left to people like you and me to trawl through the papers and have a look at the appendices and the supplementary data to actually find where there's been a bit of mischievous reporting. Well, I mean, the, the interesting thing was that I came across that when the genesis of my lecture on fiber hmm. came about, I was writing a chapter for a medical textbook hmm. on nutrition. And as you know, when you're doing writing an academic text, everything needs to be referenced to the nth degree. And I was low carb at this stage, mm -hmm. um, but I hadn't ever looked into the science of fiber. So I got to fiber and said, you know, recommendations, yes, 30 grams of fiber a day is recommended for adults. Here's the reference. I looked at it and said, well, that's an advisory statement. You know what I think about advisory statements? <laughs> Not much. Yeah. It's like, well, let me go to the advisory statement and I'll see where their references were. And I followed the chain back and it would always stop. You could see an opinion, but nowhere was the evidence actually cited. And I'm like, well, this is odd. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at research on fiber and there's a few things that are absolutely well known. So yes, it does increase the bulk of your feces. If you ingest something that the body can't absorb at all, then it's gonna to have to come out the other end. So your feces is gonna be larger, that, that's obvious. Um, it's an irritant and it can increase transit time. So things can travel through your intestines quicker. Yes, that is true. But when we actually looked at it in terms of symptoms of constipation, so as a doctor, you don't have somebody come to you and say, oh, doc, um, just over the last few months, my poops have been quite small. There's no pain or bloating, but they're just a bit small. Do you think you could just make them a bit bigger? <laughs> or, or you don't have anybody saying, you know, look, I, uh, I did a, a test and uh, it's taking uh, two and a half days for my contents to transit all the way through the gastrointestinal tract. Do you think you could speed that up 12 or 24 hours? I mean, people 
People aren't aware of this. They have no symptoms. People care about pain. They care about bloating, complain about bleeding. These kind of things are actual genuine symptoms that adversely impact on people's lives. And when I went looking at the literature for evidence that fibre could benefit these things, the, the, the diagnostic symptoms of basically constipation we use in the clinic, the data was absent. And instead, I found a beautiful experimental trial where they actually put people on different levels of fibre in their diets. They had subjects who all had idiopathic constipation. So idiopathic, uh, if you're not medically trained, so idio means idiot and <laughs> pathic means pathetic. So it's just the diagnose, diagnostic label a doctor gives to something when we don't understand it. So uh, it's more a reflection on the doctor who'll give the diagnosis because it, it's basically idiopathic means I don't understand it and I really have no intention of trying to find out. <laughs> but anyway, so these people had constipation, idiopathic constipation, uh, and they were all on, you know, you know, moderately high fibre diets. So then a bunch of them were placed on even higher fibre diets and across five domains, their symptoms all got worse. Then some of them were put on low fibre diets and their symptoms across the board generally improved. And then a group of them, the largest cohort, were placed on zero fibre diets. And in every case, all symptoms of constipation were completely eliminated. And to date, in terms of looking at symptoms of constipation, not fecal transit rate or mass or any of these, you know, surrogate markers, which don't mean anything to the real patient, not the patients that I'm seeing, but the real things like pain and bloating, uh, a zero fiber diet was hugely, hugely successful. So this was a case where I'm sort of writing a textbook chapter and I'm sort of thinking, wow, my, my understanding is completely been thrown on its end. So I, I had a choice. I could either ignore the science and just, you know, not open myself to any criticism and write it as, uh, as I was writing it. Or I could say, well, no, I've just got to call it the way I see it. I, I've got to be, you know, it's an academic textbook. I have to be a bit scientific. Let's open myself up to some uh, potentially up in some criticism, but that's unfortunate, you know, that's what, that's what the public expects us to do.